Uh, and as we spend some time, we've been spending some time these past weeks uh, looking at the God who is preparing the way. We've seen that Zachariah and Elizabeth, they reminded us that our true longing has always been for Jesus Christ. And then Mary uh, last week showed us that when the Holy Spirit conceives something in our lives, at first we may think it is for our ruin, but eventually we discover that it is for our salvation. And today we're looking at uh, a little further along in Luke 1, uh, the story of Mary and God's favor with Mary, uh, and of course the God that she glorifies, right? That's why we just ended with singing, uh, we'll give him all the glory. And that's part of the song that Mary sings. Uh, before we, uh, we get to this text, um, uh, we're going to pray again. We're, we've been praying each Sunday of Advent these words from Psalm 25 as our prayer for illumination. Let's pray. O God, make us to know your ways, teach us your paths, lead us in your truth, and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Amen. The Gospel of Luke will read the verses 39 through 56. Luke writes, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. This is the word of the Lord. Perhaps uh, one liability uh, we have, those of us who've heard the Christmas story, is, uh, is that we've heard it over and over and maybe even over again. And we know how it turns out. Right? There, there's no way to recapture that initial shock of the news of this story. That, that the God who is coming in the flesh, he is coming to show us what real life looks like. But still, here in Luke, we find this remarkable story that kind of draws us in during Advent and Christmas. And I think, uh, well, you may have many reasons for showing up this morning, Uh, But I think one of the reasons that we showed up this morning is to be reminded, not surprised. I I don't imagine too many of you want me to tell you this morning, guess what? There actually was room in the inn, right? Or, surprise, they they did DNA tests and it turns out Joseph really was the father. Or, surprise, Mary gave birth to twins, Luke and Leah and the four... Anyways... You don't want to hear that this morning. That was my token Star Wars reference, by the way. (laughs) No, you didn't show up here to be surprised. You showed up to hear and to sing the old, old story of God's advent, his coming, in a room with other people, uh, other pilgrims, and to be reassured that this story is true. And so this morning, we really want to just be reminded of this magnificent story. Now, Advent and Christmas are also times of singing. And in Luke, 
Uh, it contains, Luke contains what we might say were the original Christmas carols, uh, four particular songs about the Messiah. And these songs all have a significant place in the church through the ages, such, so much so that they each have their own fancy Latin name. And so there's, there's the first one, the Benedictus, which is Zachariah's song, the first line being, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. And then the Gloria, which was sung by the, the angels, right? Glory to God in the highest. And then there's the, the Nunc Dimittis. I actually had to look that up on YouTube to find out how to pronounce it properly. Anyways, that's Simeon's song, right? Which is, Lord, now dismiss your servant in peace. And today we look specifically at the Magnificat, right? Mary's song, my soul magnifies the Lord. And all of these songs, whether by Mary or Simeon, the heavenly host, or Zachariah, they all invite us to, enjo- to join in this kind of ancient spiritual discipline of, of making God great, magnifying the Lord. And so with Mary this morning, we want to sing, my soul magnifies the Lord. Now truly, we don't know that much about Mary, um, but her song gives us I think, wonderful insight into her thoughts and her feelings and, and her convictions. And when Mary sings, she, she is pulling in all sorts of other great songs of the faith, all of all the other great songs of her, uh, of her people. And one of the songs that she pulls strongly from is the song of Hannah. I don't, you rem- I don't know if you remember the, song of, uh, the story of Hannah, but Hannah in 1 Samuel 2 She prays, and she prays, and she prays for a son. And God gives her Samuel. And and so in both Hannah's song and in Mary's song, there's this repeated theme of God's kind of reversal of fortune by bringing down the powerful and raising up the lowly. And, And so then the very words of Hannah are right there in this song. Uh, but you also know the Psalms a little bit, perhaps. And the Psalms often talk about when justice comes down and, and when peace reigns in the world and, and what it's going to be like when the Lord finally is king. And, and so what Mary does is she also draws from those Psalms in this, her song. And she, she takes them and she pulls them all together and she draws from all these various truths of her faith. And, and she doesn't actually have to, like, go back and kind of look stuff up and it's not like oh david yeah i should maybe use that line of his and uh, because you know this is all going to be written down and i I, and i want to make sure i get this right no she she has been schooled in her faith and so she responds with this song which just draws from her faith it is within her and even mary's name which is often overlooked connects her to a song, right? Her name, I mean, we call her Mary, of course, but, but that's just the English version of a Hebrew name, Miriam. And in the original text, you, you would see Miriam right there for Mary, right there on the page. And there's a song in the Old Testament for Mary's, uh, for, uh, that Mary's song reflects, right? The, the song of Miriam. And Miriam was not only the the sister of the great leader Moses and the sister of the priest uh, Aaron, but Miriam herself is given the title prophetess in the Bible. And as a prophet, Mary sings this song that that celebrates her oppressed people's deliverance um, from their bondage to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And then... So we're invited to see the parallel between that prophet Miriam and the new Miriam, who is Mary, right here in the singing of this song. Uh, Both are are prophets of the poor, Um, and so this morning what we hear from is the prophet Mary. And and Mary, the prophet Mary, who turns out to be Mary, the mother of Jesus, but, but not quite yet Mary, the mother of Jesus. In our reading today, she's still a maiden, right? She's chosen by God to bear this message uh, before she ever bears this child. And so Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. You know, right there in, uh, in Zechariah and Elizabeth's living room, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. 
And Elizabeth and Zachariah are the first to hear the song, but the song isn't just for them. Right? It's also for her, Mary, right? And, and for the mighty one who has done great things for her. The song's also for Gabriel, who was the first to give her the good news. But it's also a song that's for everyone who will benefit. Uh, it's for the proud and powerful who will be relieved of their swelled heads. Uh, it's for the hungry who will be filled with good things. It's a song for the rich who will be sent away empty so that they can have room in them for more than money can buy. And then further, though, it's also a song for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and and for Sarah and Rebecca and Leah and Rachel. It's for all the sons and daughters of Israel who, who thought that God had somehow forgotten his promise to be with them forever, to love them forever, to give them a, a fresh and an endless life. You may have noticed this, but sometimes during congregational singing, my microphone gets accidentally left on. And then, uh, it hasn't happened today, thanks, Evan, uh, uh, although the service isn't over yet. Uh, uh, and then sometimes what you'll notice is either me singing behind time or singing ahead of time. Now, I want you to think about that for Mary. Um, She was so sure of what was happening inside of her that she is singing about it ahead of time. She's singing about it ahead of time, not in the sense of coming in too early for the music, like me, perhaps, but the words that she is singing, she, she does not say them in the future tense, but she says them in the past tense, as if the promise has already come true. Maybe you've noticed this before, but, but prophets often get their verb tenses wrong. And maybe that's because part of their gift is being able to see the world as God sees it, right? Not divided into things that are already uh, over and things that have not yet happened, uh, but instead they see the world as this kind of eternally unfolding mystery that surprises everyone. And so Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. And in some senses, her her soul then is kind of a magnifying glass enlarging this tiny baby Jesus. But what happens when, instead of magnifying God, we shrink him? If God is not magnified in our sight, I mean, other things will have to get magnified, or other things do get magnified, right? Right? Um, If our perspective of the goodness of God is somehow reduced, then the evil of the world will look that much more oppressive. If we amplify the size of our troubles, we will reduce our ability to see the, the magnitude of God's gracious power to redeem the world. And that's why magnifying God, making him great, declaring him large, Uh, exalting him is so important and powerful, a big part of our worship. To to magnify God is is to increase our attention and awareness of God and at the same time to reduce our own anxiety about a world that seems to be growing in chaos. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was an example of how God magnifies the insignificant and ignores the world's definition of magnificent. And so Mary, the the prophet, she she got it. She she doesn't wallow in her own problems, although she could, right? She's she's pregnant, she has no husband, and in that day that meant ridicule and and no status and a very dim future. Instead, what, what Mary does is she magnifies the Lord. Now, many other prophets besides Mary understood this, especially John the Baptist, right? The one who leaps inside of Elizabeth uh, when confronted with, um, uh, with Mary and the baby inside of her. John the Baptist said it was it probably in as simple of a way as possible when he was talking about Jesus. He, he said, he must increase, I must decrease. My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, there, there's a great commentary about this passage by Will Willman, um, and, and, he, and he's, talking about talking to a, he's talking to a college student 
who, who is saying, you know, the virgin birth was just too incredible to believe. 